and welcome to this training session brought to you by the Society of American Archivists, Archivists of Religious Collections section. My name is Erin Laufman, and I will now give a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of many Indigenous nations. We know that Indigenous peoples have suffered from historical and ongoing injustices and understand, as an archival organization, that we, we must work toward sharing historical truths and renew respectful relationships with Indigenous communities. We respect the longstanding relationships that Indigenous nat nations have to this land as the original caretakers. We are grateful for their stewardship and protection of the water and earth. We pay our respects to elders past and present. Today's topic is Introduction to Germanic Script. Before I introduce our presenter, let's review the disclaimer. The content in these presentations is for information only and is not legal advice. Our views do not represent the organizations where we work. We do not make any endorsement or guarantees. We are not liable for any loss or damage caused by your use of the content we provide. It is your responsibility to critically evaluate the content provided in the presentation or any accompanying materials. You will not be able to use your microphone or video during this session. You can click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen and under live transcript, click enable auto transcription to get closed captioning. There will be a question period after the presentation conclu concludes. You should use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We will not answer questions in the chat or unmute attendees due to time constraints. Please be respectful in your interactions. We expect you to follow the SAA code of conduct. The session will be recorded and please fill out the short survey after the session ends. We encourage you to join the Society of American Archivists if you are not a member. We would like to thank the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada for hosting this webinar. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Thomas McCullough. Tom has served as assistant archivist of the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for the past 10 years. He completed his undergraduate studies in history, anthropology, and European studies at Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania in May, 2011. He received a master's degree in applied history from the same university in May, 2013, focusing his graduate fieldwork in archival studies. In December 2019, he received a master's degree in library and information science with an archives concentration from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Tom previously worked or interned at the Shippensburg University Fashion Archives and Museum, the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, and the Cumberland County, Pennsylvania Archives. Tom teaches German script to adult classes and to local middle and high school, school German language classes. He is the editor of The Archival Spirit, a newsletter published three times per year by the Archivist of Religious Collections section of the Society of American Archivists, and also serves as editorial assistant of the Journal of Moravian History. Tom, please take it away. Okay, hopefully I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you, Aaron, for the introduction, and hello all from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, as, been stated, as has been stated, I am assistant archivist here at the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem. In the Moravian Archives, a repository for the Moravian Church in America's northern province, the bulk of our 18th and 19th century archival holdings are handwritten in German. Thus, it is often necessary to be able to read some German script cursive in order to process materials and to make them available to the public. In part because of our daily or almost daily exposure to German script cursive, two to three of our staff members, myself included, teach an annual two-week course on how to read and write German handwriting. Or it's a moreover a course in German paleography in general. And that course has been going on here at the Moravian Archives for over 50 years. Part of our outreach, in fact, is teaching German handwriting at local high schools, as Aaron said, and telling students what archivists do. Um, I've also taught German script workshops for the German Historical Institute, the German Society of Pennsylvania, 
and even uh, undergraduate classes in Germany at the University of Oldenburg. So the ability to read and or write German script is not the type of skill that one easily develops in 45 minutes. And our time is limited today. Um, so I don't expect all of us to be German script experts at the end of this lunch and learn. Rather, we'll instead go over some basic facts about the script. We'll review some examples of the script across different time periods. We'll briefly introduce the German script alphabet and focus primarily on the lowercase. We'll compare select letters in German script to their Latin script cursive equivalents. We'll even decipher, decipher some individual words together. Um, and lastly, I want to discuss how you can continue to learn more about German script beyond this lunch and learn session. And uh, just something about the image. This is a building plan from our collection that features a couple types of German script cursive, uh, a couple types of German scripts. Before we start with any German script fundamentals, let's just take a quick look at the alphabet just so that we can visualize the script we'll be discussing. Um, Aaron will share this document in the chat, either now or later in the session. You can download it to your computer and you can take a look at it yourself, um, just so that you'll have a, a table to actually look at when we're deciphering a text together. So this will be shared in the chat, in this document. So some of the, the characters will look familiar in this alphabet, like Bs and Ls. If you see the lowercase b and the lowercase l, they don't look very different from Latin script cursive. Um, some will look rather unusual, such as Es and Hs. If you take a look at E and H in this table, they should be completely unusual um, if you're familiar with Latin script cursive. This is a whole, whole different character. Um, and then some letters will look similar but more jagged. And an example of that would be let's say the C, the M, or the N. So if you take a look at the lowercase C, the lowercase M, and the lowercase N, you'll see that uh, unlike Roman script cursive where they, they're more round to those letters, you'll see that they're much more jagged in German script. We'll take a, a longer look at this alphabet in a little while. I just want you to have a sense of this alphabet before we get started with any basics. So also known as Kohlrenschrift, um, German script is what we would now describe as an antiquated form of German handwriting. It developed out of a black letter script known as Bastarda during the early 1500s, um, and it remained in regular use among German speakers all the way up until the Second World War. Um, it differs from Latin script cursive in a variety of ways, um, and this is the type of script that we may be familiar with from elementary years, um, depending on where you are, this English language uh, we'll use Latin script cursive, as well as various languages in Europe will use Latin script cursive, and that's what we'll be most familiar with, familiar with from a penmanship perspective. Um, current script is a completely different uh, family of scripts. It encompasses all the styles or schools of German cursive handwriting from the early 16th century through the 20th century, though you will hear, albeit mistakenly, I should say many refer to German script as Suterlin today, um, Suterlin developed in 1911 and is just one of the final forms of German script that was used in German schools. Um, so sometimes it's refer it's used to refer collectively to all current schrift, and that's a bit of a mistake. Um, but beginning in 1911, Suterlin script or Suterlin schrift was, was the most common uh, type of script used in German schools. By January 1941, most German school programs had moved on to Deutsche Normalschrift which um, would be comparable to the Latin script cursive that English speakers and archivists in various repositories would be most familiar with. So researchers in all disciplines from musicology to reformation studies to genealogy are likely to come across German script documents. And the corpus of text will not be strictly confined to German speaking areas of Europe, like Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, where German might be an official language, but it's also, you'll see German script documents in places where um, there have historically been large populations of German speaker, speakers, such as parts of Poland, southern Denmark, um, around the Danish border region. You'll also see uh, German script documents prevalent in US locations uh, with historical German populations, such as Wisconsin and Minnesota, or Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. Uh, some Moravian church congregations, in my case, uh, we Moravian church congregations in the Edmonton area in Alberta uh, used German script through, through World War I. 
Um, so even into the 20th century, we're still using German script cursive in Canada. Um, and you'll see this as well in Ontario among some different religious groups. Uh, it may come as a surprise to also see German script documents in a place like Tanzania uh, or Tanzania, if you will, um, former German East Africa, a colony, um, Cameroon, Togo, other areas with colonial connections to uh, Germany, you might find documents or might be confronted with documents in, in German script cursive while trying to do research or trying to help users. Many of our audience members, I think, are archivists, records managers, and librarians who work with religious groups, or work with the religious collections, I'm sorry, uh, wherever German-speaking religious groups may have worshipped or proselytized, such as St. Croix in the Danish West Indies, uh, Northern Queensland in Australia, we can expect to be confronted with documents handwritten in German script cursive. Uh, finally, we also see Koranschrift or, or uh, German cursive in Danish and Norwegian language documents. Um, of course, with some variations for alphabetical letters that do not exist in German, uh, but you see this well into the, in, into the late 19th century. Um, and that can come as a surprise to see Danish documents using a script that is uh, prevalent in the German language. Okay, so I wanted to show some sample documents um, from 1631 until 1938. I mentioned that German script um, was developed in the 16th century. Um, I'm jumping ahead here to the 17th with the document from 1631, but this will allow us to see how the script changes a bit over time, but remains the same in other ways. So this first item is a blank passport. Um, it's actually signed by the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus during the Thirty Years' War. Um, this would have been issued to someone seeking to move freely through uh, the vicinity of Verben, and that was the site of a major battle in former Brandenburg uh, between 30 plus thousand troops just a few days after the passport was issued. I think it was on August 7th. Um, with texts that are this old, transcription is complicated by spellings that we might not be accustomed to. Um, in standard high German, such as the third word in the fourth line. Let me see if I can pull up my laser pointer. Um, so the third word in the fourth line right here, uh, that word is Gnädigsten. Um, and today you would spell that with an A umlaut as the, the third letter. Here it's an E. Uh, it's, the sound is not much different, but instead of an A umlaut, we have an E in Gnädig. Uh, if we, another thing that makes it difficult are there's words that are you know, simply not used in German any longer, um, or you wouldn't hear anyone speaking German use them today. So right down here, if you see, I'm hovering just below this word, benebenst, for example, you won't see the word benebenst um, in a modern uh, German language context. Uh, let's see. And another major difficulty is the interchangeable use of U's and V's. Um, so my screen is really small, but hopefully I can still read this. Um, on this second line, you'll see two U's in a row. So that, that, that little accent above the letter signifies, I'm a U, read me as a U. Um, so we have in the first line, Dem not for Zeiger Dieses, and that's where you would have the name of the passport recipient. It's blank because it hasn't been used. And then on the next, next line, we have Zeiner Angelegenheit nach Zufereisen. So we have Z-U-V as the first three letters of this fourth word. Um, and as a transcriber, one has to make a decision, okay, one letter is a U, one letter is a V. And that, that, that stems from the, the former interchangeable use of U and Vs in Latin. Okay, jumping forward in time, this next sample comes from a, a church register or church book, if you will, here in the Moravian Archives, Bethlehem. Um, here we can see script writing that was used for baptisms that occurred in the Moravian church in Oley, Pennsylvania. And this is during the 1740s and 1750s. Um, you may be able to note on this page uh, several different scripts. 90% um, of the entries are in German script cursive. Um, so really most of what you're seeing here are German scripts. So that, they're that Korrent script that's the subject of today's Lunch and Learn. Then we also have another script called Kanzlei Schrift or chancery script used for the names Johanna, Katerina, and Salome, um, add some emphasis using this, this other type of, of script called Kanzlei Schrift. 
Then we also have Latin script cursive for words that, of course, um, have Latin roots, anno. This is a Latin word, so the author here recognizes that, and they write anno in a completely different script. But why would they write it in German um, when they're not writing a German word? So that's sort of their thinking there. And this is really common across German language documents um, or German script documents that you'll see German script in conjunction with other types of scripts. Um, you'll see Latin used for loan words as well. So if we look back in the last text, you may have seen this word here, uh, solda tesca. So this is um, Italian, Hungarian, use uh, many languages use the word solda tesca. And you see it's written in Roman script cursive. It's not a German word and the author realizes this, um, referring to a type of troop uh, and, or offizieren, officers. You know, offizi in the beginning is coming from Latin. So it's written in Latin script cursive. So you see mid, mid word, someone is even changing script there. Uh, this next sample is again from a Moravian church record. Um, however, this time it's from a congregation in Northern Maryland. Uh, with German language church records and with any church records, we're confronted with abbreviations and symbols occasionally in German script, uh, which, which complicate things when we're trying to do transcription. Um, in the funeral records depicted in the detail, we see several abbreviations that are specific to German script. Uh, and I could see one down here, this U, for example, that sits by itself with the accent above it. Um, that just means und, and, and that is common across all German script documents. You, you would, you'll be confronted with this abbreviation. You'll add it to your foreschrift, your repertoire of all the things you can read. Um, and from that point forward, you'll always know that a U sitting by itself, almost always that's going to mean und. Uh, we also see several abbreviations that are specific to the content. And, you know, depending on what type of uh, religious groups records we're looking at, um, there will be different types of abbreviations. Here we have an abbreviation BR, Bruder. Um, so the deceased person here is referred to as Brother Hartman Fertris. Brother uh, is being used because Moravians, Moravian church, uh, members refer to one another as brothers and sisters. So um, I'm not, uh, this is not an unusual abbreviation for me to see Bruder or Schwester, brother or sister. Um, and several symbols appear in the text that are just downright unusual. And this is with any any type of text, we, we um, will come across abbreviations or symbols that, that we maybe have not seen before. Um, and what, some examples that we see here are this moon symbol for Mon Montag, the day of the moon, uh, where we get our name for the day Monday. Um, so this was a Monday, the 28th of December at noon uh, in 1778, Hartman Fertrice died. Um, now we could Google this today, what day of the week was December 28th, 1778, but it is cool that we, we can quickly discern that here. We also see Zontag, uh, this day of the sun, Sunday for the next entry. So these types of symbols um, you may come across and, and you just add them to your repertoire of what you're able to read with German script. Okay, move on to the next slide here. Um, I wanted to show us a 19th century German script handwriting example. And this one comes from the Österreichs Staatsarchiv, um, the National Archives of Austria, uh, which is in Vienna. Uh, the reason I showed this, I was working on transcription for uh, a an author uh, who studies uh, Ottoman history. Um, and these were documents that uh, related the history of Ottoman growing unrest in Crete um, in 1896, 1895 and 1896 uh, between Cretan revolutionaries and the Ottoman Empire. Um, and they were from, they're written from an Austrian diplomat who was in Crete and he was writing back to Vienna about the things that were happening. Um, the thing that I find really interesting and difficult about 19th century German script is that uh, up until this period of time, quill pens with um, a standard point um, are, are the common instrument that is used for writing up until this period. By about 1820, 1821, you start to have the introduction of metal nibbed quill pens um, they allow one to write much thinner, um, they, and you'll see that the script is much thinner than, than it is um, in these other texts. I find that to be a little bit more difficult to read. There's some variation in the characters. Instead of doing an S, 
like this. So that's the motion for an S in 18th century script. In 19th century script, it's up and down. So it's just a simple uh, change that with the pen that allows you to do that without ink going everywhere. Um, this next sample shows that Suderlin script that, uh, or at least in the middle of the page, gives you a sample of Suderlin script. This comes from the Hedwig and Berthold Edelmut collection at the Leo Beck Institute. Um, here in this example, you can see several scripts on the same page. Um, as family in Germany send greetings to Truda Edelmut in New York City. Um, the, many of the senders here were, are, are, were victims in the Holocaust, um, and these letters are preserved in the Leo Beck Institute. Um, in the middle message from Rosal, so you see Dinah Rosal here, she says, you're Rosal. Uh, we have a good example of Suterlin script. So, liebe Truda, wie du siehst, bin ich immer noch zu Hause. As you see, I'm, you know, I remain at home. Uh, die Spielen sind immer noch geschlossen. So, you know, the plays are, are, are closed or the movies are closed. And uh, there's some, some greetings to Truda in New York City. Here you can see a really good example of how Suterlin script is a bit different from the scripts above, which I would consider older cursive scripts. And then you also see Latin script cursive here. So from someone named Silva, who, who apparently does not use current shrift uh, in, in writing to Truda. So now that we've uh, reviewed some examples from different time periods, uh, let's return to the German script alphabet I showed earlier in the session. Um, this document has been shared with you in the chat. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to download it, please download it now. Uh, take a moment and let's think about how some of these letters compare to the characters used in Latin script cursive. Many of the letters are more jagged in German script, like the lowercase c and the lowercase i. So where is i? You can see how it's not round coming up like we're used to in cursive. It's a jagged 45 degree angle up and straight back down or a slight angle. But it's much more jagged than the rounded letters where we may be accustomed to in Latin script cursive. And also take a look at some of the lowercase vowels like A. Notice that the top of this is open, the top part of the A. And that can be a little bit challenging to see as a single letter when you have that opening. It's easy to read it as two. Take a look at this O. Again, open at the top. And that can be complicated. Am I looking at a C in another letter or am I looking at a vowel here? Um, and in this case, it would be a vowel. What letters uh, co appear completely different to you? Maybe the letters E. This is very different than Latin script cursive, this E here, in addition to the uppercase E. What about the lowercase r? This is a lot different than Roman script cursive as well. How about the H's? These are pretty different as well. So they go above the line and below the line, and these make a figure eight. So I'm gonna close down my PowerPoint in a moment and I'll share the Zoom whiteboard with you. And this way I'll be able to show actually how to, how to create some of these. If you have a piece of paper, you can, you can grab that um, and you can try to, to write these down yourself um, in practice. Okay, so let me just end my share. Share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see my whiteboard. Just going to check the. Okay, I was just looking at the chat just to see if I missed anything from anyone. All right. So, set this up. You'll see some really crooked blue lines from me that I did right before the workshop began. So, forgive me for those crooked lines. And we'll see how this turns out. So hopefully that came through and you're able to see that. You can see the word ish or, or I-C-H, um, one of the most common words in German, ish or I. 
So this gives us a chance to look at two uh, major differences between letters. So let's look at the letter I. This is often confused with the letter C. The only difference is the I dot. So we can see it's this lightning bolt that sits on its side, if you will, right in the middle area, very small letter. But these two letters are often very easy to lose, the I and the C in German script cursive. When you're reading a word and you're transcribing, they can easily get lost in the text. Okay, I'm gonna close this out here, undo those. Now I wanna show you the E and the N. So again, this is gonna be the letter E, 45 degree angle up from the baseline up to the midline, then another 45 degree angle like that. And then we have the letter N. We can see how similar these are. There's a bit more space in the middle right here. So this is your letter N and this is your letter E. Just take a moment to, to practice those two yourself. Now what happens when people are writing the E very quickly in text, the E becomes this little blob. And we always tell folks that when in doubt, that little blob is an E. And it's always a good guess because E is the most common letter in the German language. So if you think you, you're seeing an E, you're probably looking at an E. At least it's a, through process of elimination, it's a good guess. I'll show you what that little blob would look like when I write fast. So I'm gonna write very fast here, the word D-E-R, der. And see what happened? I went very fast as writers do, and they end up with this little blob of ink. That's what happens with, with writing. It's no longer that perfect E we just learned, but it becomes this little blob. So when in doubt, that little blob is an E. We will delete the word dare here. I wanna show you two other letters that are often confused with one another, R and V, lowercase r and lowercase v. The R hooks like this, bumps over, back up, and ends in an upward position. It's a bit unusual. Now what makes it different from the V the V begins exactly the same way, it bumps over, but when it gets up to here, we must pull it around all the way back down to the baseline. Okay, so that's our differences between the R and the V, and the ending is really important here because this is how we're gonna connect to the next word. So if the word was fun, a really common, word in German, von or from, of, we have V, O, V, O, N. And if I were to connect from, and change my ink from up here, I'd have written the word Ron, R-O-N, which is not a word in German. And then you can know you're, something's probably happening incorrectly here. So we'll delete that. And then we correctly have the word von. If we're connecting from the R at the top, we will have RE, for example. Very different. Okay, let's delete this here, all this chicken scratch I have on the screen. Okay. So next I wanna show uh, the W. This is a pretty unusual letter and it's often seen as a couple um, and it's understandable. So we have that 45 degree angle. This is a W. And then we wanna make that V we just learned. So it almost looks like we made a C and a V, but this is really a W. So I'll show this again. We have 45 degree angle, we drop down. We come back up, we start to make our V we just learned. Then we have a really nice W. Okay. 
Okay. You're doing pretty well so far. Looked like someone wrote what is mu in the chat. Um, I can show what, what mu would look like or how you'd write it. So when you get up to here, you're going to come back around. Maybe they were asking how to write mu. So that was something in the q and Not sure if I understood that correctly, but hopefully that's what you were looking for. Oh, what was the word that we wrote just before this one? Uh, I cannot remember. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so two other vowels that I wanna show that are often confused with one another are A and O. So the letter A, and O. And what's important to see here is that neither letter is closed at the top, which is a bit different from Latin script cursive. Another thing to see as well is this bump over right here. This is sometimes interpreted mistakenly as an additional letter added to an O. However, you're looking at an A and Understanding that an A is a bit of a longer letter than the O is really helpful. So these are two letters that are commonly mistaken with one another, A and O. O connects from that middle portion right here. It'll connect right here into the next letter, whereas A will connect from the bottom. Okay. I wanna show three letters now that are the longest letters in German script lowercase. Okay, Sally, before I continue, Sally thankfully, thankfully uh, wrote in the Q&A that I was comparing R and V to W, and the word was fawn that was written earlier. Fawn, V-O-N was the word earlier. Okay, I'm going to now show you the long S, the F, and the H. So these are three very long lowercase letters. We have S, we have F, and notice the distinction here, there's a loop. I create an imitation cross stroke based on 18th century German handwriting. There can be an actual cross stroke here but you'll notice that there's a loop in the F and that's the big distinction from the S that you see to the left. So we have an S, an F, and now this third character, which is also large in the lowercase and a bit unusual, is the H. And we have two loops. Now we don't always have two loops, an example of when we might not have two loops in the H, that final letter would be the end of a word. Someone doesn't feel like finishing that second loop. A word like leich or ish, that final H, they just do the top loop and they drop to the bottom because they don't need to connect to another word. But these are three letters that are commonly confused, S, F, and H. Does anyone have any questions about the lowercase alphabet? Maybe a letter that you're seeing that you'd like to see replicated on the board here? I'll wait a moment just to see if anyone has any questions about the, the lowercase alphabet. Yes, okay, so Sally asked about the use of two S's. I'm glad that you asked this. So you have in old German script and you have in old English, long S's and closed S's. Um, in German, we call them the long S and Schluss S. So the long S looks like this and it is 
as described lang or long. So it's a long S. And then we have a Schluss S, which begins here and goes up and around. Now, why would we have two different S's? So one S open, opens up a sil syllable and one S closes out a syllable. So my name, for example, is Th Thomas or Tomas. So I would use a long S at the end of my name. Or a, a Schluss S, a closed S, because the syllable ends with that S. So even a German word like house ends on that S and it would use this type, uh, a Schluss S. This is pretty complicated, but a long S would be used in a word like schwimmen, to swim. So the word schwimmen, I'll delete my name Thomas with the use of the, the Schluss S, the closing S, and I'll write the word schwimmen. Or at least the beginning of it. There's the S-C-H-W in schwimmen. Gonna run out of room here. But you can see the use of a long S because this is the beginning of the syllable, if that makes sense. If you look at older printed text, you will see the use of two S's. Um, OCR notoriously, reads them incorrectly uh, as Fs in English. Um, and yeah, but this is an example of that long S and Schluss S. Let me see if there's other questions. Uh, Julia asked about the lowercase p. Uh, and if I could show that on the board. So the lowercase p, yeah, this one is a bit confusing. Um, so we begin with the 45 degree angle, we curl, and then right here, I try to think of creating an S, a, a slight S shape before I loop back up. Um, and what do I mean by that S shape? Maybe you see it right here. There's just a slight curve that gives me enough space in order to come back up and around. And if the German word was puts in, for example, ran out of room. That's how we would connect with the P into the into the next word. So it puts in when meaning to decorate or clean. Yeah. Okay, I will delete that. Hopefully that helped with the P. Let's see. The next question. Uh, someone asked if there are modifications of specific letters when combining. Um, that's absolutely true. Uh, there are definitely ligatures. We refer to these as ligatures in German script. Um, I'll show just one example. Um, a really common ligature that you'll see is S T. So this is an S and a T. Uh, and you see that we just drop right from the top part of that S right down into a T. It's a bit unusual. We're, we're cropping out a bunch of the letter. Um, and this is a ligature that's very specific. So if the, if the word was um, starten, then we would have S-T, A-R-T continuing from here. So that's an example of one ligature. Um, I'll show another one. So the word Stadt in German uh, ending in a D-T ends, could end like this. So going from that D loop to the right, dropping right down into a T. So this is a DT. Another example that you might see is the SCH, or we say the SCH ligature, SCH. Um, this is really common in German, SCH. A lot of words begin this way. So you might see a ligature like this for SCH. And it just crops out some of the letters as people are writing. Uh, James asks if the S set comes up in handwriting. It, it indeed does. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it, um, but one of the most basic ways is to literally think about that S I just did and end with a Z. 
connecting into our next letter. All right, I'm gonna close out of here. I know you probably have more questions, but I am going to get into our next exercise real quick. So let me stop my share. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint again. So hopefully you have this, this alphabet at your disposal. You've been able to download it. Um, after this crash course in German script history and the basics, I don't expect anyone to feel super confident in deciphering texts. However, practice makes perfect and we, we, we are definitely gonna try right now. Um, so this is from a 1758 letter that was sent from New England and I've cropped out from this text a few words that give us an opportunity to attempt a letter by letter transcription. So we're gonna move on. This is a five letter word. Now I want everyone to take a few moments to decipher as much of the word as possible. Um, and I'll wait, I'll wait uh, 30 seconds to give you a chance to start to start deciphering this word. I won't be able to monitor in the chat, but I will start working through the word uh, momentarily. Okay, so I haven't given you a lot of time, but I'm gonna start working through this word. The first letter, or maybe, what would I would do in transcribing this? Here are some tips. We tell everyone to read letter by letter. Don't try and read words. Um, that's when you get into trouble and you start seeing things on the page that aren't there. It happens to me too. Uh, we tell people to find the E. When, we, when we're doing German script curses, where's the E? That's a problem letter that's hard to read. And so in this word, there are two E's. There's one right here, if you can follow my highlighter. And there's one right here. There must be an I dot, so there must be an I somewhere because there's an I dot, I see that here. The troubling thing is, what is it over? Is it over this stroke? Is it over this stroke? Well, it happens to be over the first stroke because the word is einem. So we have an E here and it breaks right there and begins the I. Then we begin our N, then our E, and then our jagged M, three strokes. It's a very big letter. Hopefully some of you were able to, to decipher that word. Okay, this next word is three letters. Take a few moments to work on this. Remember that Schluss that I told you about? So just take a few moments to see if you can decipher this word. It's only three letters. Okay, so hopefully, thanks to my clue, you were able to make out this last letter. And this is a Schluss S, or one of those ending S's, a closed S. Um, just a tip, we tell people sometimes to read from the right to the left. So that's something I might do in this situation when I see that really obvious S at the end. Okay, I know I have an S at the end of this, of this word. Now I'm going to work to the left because I know what is left of it must be a new letter. So I'm going to go letter by letter to the left. I have this, what looks to be like a vowel, and it looks to be open at the top. So I have an A, and then I have this really, really big uh, letter at the front that I told you, I told you this word was only three letters, so maybe that helps a little bit. We have this 45 degree angle, then we have a start of a V. So what does that mean? We have a W. So we have W-A-S, was. So hopefully some of you were able to decipher that one. Okay, moving on. 
This is our first time we'll have seen two of these letters. This is a three letter word. Take a few moments to see if you can transcribe it. So it's a three letter word. Okay, so this first character here is revealed by this accent above it, which we call an ubogen, or a U-curve. A U-curve only appears above a U. So it's the letter U. It's not a U with an umlaut, the two dots. Rather, it's just a U. So the first letter is U, and then we have two more 45-degree strokes. So we have an N in the middle, and then we have to start our next letter. We have this 45 degree angle here. We come up and loop to the right. That's our lowercase d. So the word is und. Very common in German script. You'll see this quite a bit. Simply because the letter and, or the word and is a common thing to say in a sentence. Okay, this is a longer word here. It is six letters, six letters. And it has one of those long letters to start. So hopefully I went over three very long letters, the S, the F, and the H. Hopefully you can discern which one it is here. Take a few moments to decipher this word. A few of the letters may be very recognizable to you if you know Latin script cursive. And they might be in the middle of the word. So if you were guessing it, in the middle of the word, we have two L's. L is in lizard, two L's here. To the left of that, we have a vowel, we have an O. To the right of that, we have an E. We also have a long S and an N. So the word is zollen, zollen, shall, supposed to, word is zollen. So hopefully you were able to see that long S here. Okay, and this is our Second to last word that I've cropped out from the text. It is four letters long, four letters. So just take a moment to see if you can break down this word into four characters. Okay. So maybe we, we can start with our first letter. Here we have a big one that loops up and drops back down below the baseline. This is one of those three big letters that I mentioned in the lowercase. This is an H. Remember, two loops is an H. Then we have an I because of the I dot here. Then we have a little blob, which when in doubt is an E. And then we have an R, of course, finishing in an upward position, like I said. So again, this word is H-I-E-R, here, here. Hopefully a few of you were able to get that one. I saved a big one for last. So this letter is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 letters, 11 letters, this word. Take a few moments to see if you can Read some of these letters, if not all, even some is always a step in the right direction. Remember, we're not trying to read words, we're, we're trying to decipher letter by letter. Something to do when you're working with an individual text is you can, verif you can try to verify the letters that you're unsure of. Um, so maybe this letter is a bit difficult to read in this text. And I see later in the document, Oh, okay, there's that letter and I know what this word says. So that can reveal what this letter is or it can reveal that you've mistranscribed something. So 
uh, always check around the page and look for other examples of the same letter. Sometimes it helps to cover up parts of the word. So maybe you, you have a hard time reading uh, what's to right to the right of the D at the very beginning. Well, if you cover up the D, then you can maybe easily see that it's an E to the right of that. Hopefully you are be able to get this one. The word is Dame Zelbegin, very big word. Um, before we jump into Q&A, I just wanna tell you a few places where you can learn more. This will be recorded, so you, or it is being recorded. So you will have a chance to turn back to this video on the ARCS Models and Resources YouTube page. Uh, but these are just some ideas of places where you can go for more help. Um, there's Germany Unlocked uh, is a website of Catherine Schober. Uh, who's a, a German script uh, specialist and translator. Um, here I mentioned at the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, um, there's openings for this year's course in June. Um, so just a month from now, there's a few openings left. Uh, it's a two week course where fe people learn German script cursive. So you can find out more on the archives website. You'll find single workshops that meet at universities and colleges. Um, you also find one-time workshops at historical societies and, and colleges in the United States and in Germany. There's some websites where you can find information online. Um, another way to, to practice and to learn is to join a Facebook group that does transcription. So I'm, I'm in this Facebook group, Suterlinschrift, uh, and people post documents and offer insight. So that's something that you can, uh, they offer their opinions on what something says. That's a good way to get practice. Um, another way is to volunteer. To, to help transcribe in archives. If you know German and you can practice the script, practice, is, practice makes perfect and that's really the way to learn. Um, so I'm gonna stop my share. I know we're at Q and A time. So um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. That was really informative and illuminating and fun. Um, I learned so much today, thank you. So we have, um, we have a couple questions. Um, in the chat, and um, one of them is um, a question about, do you have an example from the Ephrata Cloister by any chance? We would in our collection here. Um, I didn't feature one. Um, mm -hmm. We would happen to, the, the Moravians uh, are very active in Pennsylvania, the Ephrata Cloister being in, in Pennsylvania. Um, that, it was an interesting relationship between the Moravians and the Ephrataners. Uh, Sometimes I would say love hate, um, and there's a lot of correspondence back and forth. Um, you would see German script used by the Ephrata Cloister, um, hundred percent used by Conrad Beisel, uh, writing to Moravians in here in Bethlehem, um, other members of the community as well. Uh, we do have books here from the Ephrata Cloister that are printed in German script, uh, black letter, um, but print. I'm not really talking about printing today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, there, there would be such examples. Thank you. So um, right now we're just getting lots of thank yous in the Q&A. Appreciated the exercises. Thank you very much. Danka. <laughs> uh, we have a, a comment um, from Carrie. This has been incredibly interesting. For anyone who has worked in archives with not commonly used languages, i.e. archaic Russian, Spanish, et cetera, this is very inspiring. Yeah. Um... I didn't know German script when I started here at the Moravian Archives. I knew German. Um, I didn't even really knew such a script existed before I started here. So it was a real crash course my first week. Um, I've been doing it for 10 years and I've been teaching it to people and teaching it really helps reinforce it. I look at it every day. I write in the script. Um, I sign checks. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but um, that uh, I use the script as my, my handwriting. Uh, for mm -hmm. the most part. And that really, really makes it easy to read um, text because I can imagine myself as the writer. So I encourage folks um, to practice writing. Uh, that that really gives you a better ability to read German script. Thank you. Um, another uh, question we have are um, historically, are the V and Y related? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I I can't say. I can't say that that they are. Um, there's there's definitely a historical relationship between the I J and the Y, mm -hmm. and you'll often see in German script Ys written with two dots over the top, which you could read as an I and a J, which 
I and J exist together in the Dutch language. Um, like friendly, um, friendly. Um, but um, yeah, I would default to my Dutch supervisor uh, who, who, could, who could fill more in on the relationship between the Y and the IJ. Uh, but I don't know as much about the V. Uh, maybe there is, but I don't want to misspeak. Okay, thank you. Another question is for those abbreviations and symbols that may be neat to church documents, is there a resource for that? Yeah, um, there are definitely resources online. I think a, a good place to start with is probably, um, you know, Family Search has a good page on German language genealogy. They might not explain um, those abbreviations in the context of German script cursive, but if you're familiar with abbreviations in general that are used in, in German records, whether they be genealogical records, um, then that'll kind of like open up your lexicon on how you could be deciphering something um in a handwritten context uh we we have oh thank you uh julia uh biker Sarah, biker shared a good resource mm -hmm. um we have a, a an abbreviation guide that we give to participants in the german script seminar here at the moravian archives that's the two-week course i mentioned um it's about 20 pages of abbreviations mm -hmm. uh and they're wow. they're handwritten out um if anyone is interested in that uh, I know we, we we don't encourage folks to follow up. My email address, you can find if you go to the moraviachurcharchives.org website. Um, if you go to moraviachurcharchives.org, you can find uh, our info account. Just send an email there um, that you were interested in abbreviation guide. I'd be happy to to send you to send you that guide. Thank you. Um... I don't know if we have time for this, but uh, another uh, participant asks, can I see the difference between H and J in lowercase? Oh, I can't hear you somehow. Can you hear me now? No, yes. Okay. Uh, so I'll show, I'll show the difference. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, hopefully you can see my whiteboard. Yes. So the H has that figure eight. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty long letter and the J is a lot like our Latin script cursive that, that we'd be familiar with in the English language. Yeah, so it's much smaller, it doesn't have that top loop. So it's missing this whole area. Very good, thank you. Um, another question is, have you had experience with German immigrants that have learned English but wrote in this German script? Oh, um, you know what? I, I don't know if I've ever seen, or I don't, I'm, I, I, I'd be troubled to think of a case where someone was writing in English using the script. Mm -hmm. English looks funny in this script, I would say, and, and for a reason, because there's characters that that don't work next to each other, that, that work in English, but they don't exist in German next to each other. Mm -hmm. So an example would be, um, I can't think of an example, but there's letters that don't feel right next to each other. Um, and so it would look odd. I, I am able to see at the end of documents that are in the English language, let's say it's, it's a courthouse document, when someone signs their name, I can tell immediately what that person's first language is sometimes because, mm -hmm. um, it, it, because they write their name in German script cursive, even though it's an English language course, courthouse document, they're signing as a witness or they're, or they're a participant in uh, the document. Uh, somehow, maybe they, they're purchasing property, selling property, et cetera, but they're signing their name and the way that they write their name, even if in the document, they're called like Johann, John Slaughter. And then mm -hmm. their name, they sign it Johannes Schlachter in German script. Then I get a better sense of what their name really was. Uh, or how, what language they may be used in the household. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think that's about all the time we have for Q&A right now, um, and it's time to close out the, uh, the session. Um, I would like to thank you very much again, Tom, um, such an informative session. And also to mention that um, the next uh, Lunch and Learn is Introduction to Digital Preservation on May 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So with that, I believe we, uh, we are concluding. Thank you again very much, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.